Hello. <clears throat> Hello everyone. My name is Fred Randall. I am an environmental studies major and geology minor here at St. Lawrence University and today I will be talking about starfish and what's happening to them. So from these first few pictures we can see on the right there are some perfectly healthy starfish but on the left it seems to be just an imprint of a starfish or what's left of it. And we'll get in that, into that later, but first I wanted to start us off with a common character that we all know and love. Hello everyone, my name is Fred Randall. I am a junior here at St. Lawrence studying uh, environmental studies as my major and geology as my minor. And today I'm here to talk to you about starfish and what is happening to them. So on the right, we can see a nice healthy starfish living at the bottom of some coastal area. But on the left, we have a starfish that, or I should say an outprint imprint of a starfish on the ground after it has been attacked by a disease that I will go into shortly. But as you can see, the overall effect on the starfish is pretty substantial. First, I want to talk about Patrick Star. We all know and love Patrick Star. I'm sure many of us grew up watching him on SpongeBob SquarePants. So does he need our help? He does. Patrick's uh, livelihood, you can say, from the Bikini Bottom is based on the west coast of California. And his species and all other starfish species in this area are being attacked by this disease called sea star wasting disease. And I thought just tying in um, a character that we know would bring us all closer and try to have a more emotional connection to this problem that's been going on for the past decade. So, starfish. Why are they important? They are more important than you would think. So, on the right, I have a diagram of starfish ecosystem, which would be a kelp forest, most likely, in what uh, I am looking at. And you can see all these connections to the starfish, such as mussels, which are a source of food, and all these other um, organisms or microorganisms that depend on the starfish for them to stay alive and for that biodiversity to remain. But on the left here, this is one year after the removal of starfish, and you can just see by the amount of species present that um, starfish are extremely important in keystone species and keeping biodiversity healthy and allowing for more species to be flourishing rather than species going extinct in those ecosystems due to their presence and not being there. Now, in Northern California, as I have mentioned California before, because this is where the main study of it is happening, um, there was areas in kelp forests where 90% um, of a certain species of starfish, the sunflower starfish, was taken out by this starfish wasting disease. Now, in those ecosystems, starfish are, as I said before, keystone species and keeping um, biodiversity and ecosystem health as healthy as they can. On the right here, I have the cycle of this marine ecosystem. So as you can see, this also includes climate change and global warming, which I'll be getting into early, uh, later in the talk. But kelp brings down and sequesters uh, emissions from the atmosphere that we release. And so does the ocean. The ocean can take in a lot of heat um, so that 
our land temperatures do not spike or drop as um, increasingly due to climate change. But as we can see in this small diagram, um, there's a little focus on the sea star. So starfish have an important um, role of taking care of bottom feeder creatures such as oysters, mussels, or in this case sea urchins. These species are able to take down these kelp forests, almost like chopping down and deforestation of forests. They will run through eating all of the kelp until not a of it is left, which will destroy habitats and um, nutrition from other species in the habitat, while also affecting even larger species such as the sea otter and larger mammals that we wouldn't expect because uh, the kelp allows strong protection um, to in its inhabitants, especially sea otters or sea lions that might be um, hiding from larger predators such as sharks. So starfish wasting disease. Um, on this diagram here, I've shown a small progression of what happens to the starfish after it, um, this disease attacks it. So on zero days, it looks normal. Three days, still a little bit normal but paler. And then on day nine, we can start to see these white lesions, which is the first uh, telltale sign of the wasting disease. And on day 12, we see the limbs starting to split apart and crawl away from each other. This is also another um, later stage effect of this disease. And then finally, we have super puffy, dismembered limbs uh, on day 15, which is one of the final stages, other stages including complete um, desiccation and turned into an almost outline which I showed you in the beginning slide. Starfish are dying. So in this chart here, I have a picture of the California coast all the way from north to south. And um, in this, we have the different categories, as I mentioned in the previous slide, of star waste, starfish wasting disease. And right here, we have starfish counts in certain areas where this disease has become prominent. So for areas such as Shaw's Cove, Treasure Island, um, and Crystal Cove, all of these areas are going from numbers of starfish species in the hundreds to zero or only having one starfish or one starfish species left. And this is all in 2013 and 2014 when this um, epidemic in the ocean began to have a strong effect on starfish populations. Now, is it a virus or is it a bacteria? The answer is that it's still inconclusive, but recent research has found that it is most likely caused from bacteria. And bacteria has a plentiful cycle, as you can see from this chart in front of you, that um, they're spread throughout the entire ocean and marine ecosystems. So the bacteria that is attached to the starfish and eats away at it and causes the wasting disease, once that starfish is dead, that bacteria will be moved and dissolved and pass through phytoplankton and zooplankton and be spread um, into different ecosystems. This is a big problem, especially with how increasingly fast this disease is taking out um, and decimating starfish populations. But the main thing that's allowing for this spread and this constant spread to keep going is the warming of waters and global warming in general, for it is allowing uh, this bacteria to spread further and further into 
what we would say colder um, water ecosystems farther north, which is allowing for those um, ecosystems and starfish species to become less diverse, and in many cases, having those starfish species completely decimated. Now, the lead expert on this starfish wasting disease is Dr. Drew Harbell from Cornell University. She's been surveying and monitoring uh, this, the spread of this disease since 2013. She's done around 12,000 surveys monitoring starfish occurrences and the range in which this disease has traveled, which is around 3,000 kilometers at this point, and with warming waters may continue to spread further than that. She um, released a book, obviously, The Ocean Outbreak, uh, Confronting the Rising Tide and Marine Disease. This book highlights the effects of climate change and global warming of our coastal waters and how it has allowed for this disease that is destroying ecosystems um, and destroying populations of starfish and in cascades destroying other species due to its, um, the starfish's ability to be a keystone species. And this studying is still going on today. She's still head of the research, but she was the first to figure this out and make that connection that warming waters is allowing for this to spread and endure for over a decade now. So, as I mentioned before with uh, Dr. Harvell, climate change is one of the main drivers. So in 2018, this was um, a picture taken of coastal waters um, in California, and this is a thermo uh, technological picture, so it highlights which areas are warmer, and in 2018 uh, specifically, and in 2013 and 2014 where this um, epidemic hit its peak, waters um, on the coast of California were seven to eight degrees uh, higher than normal, which has allowed for the disease to have a faster spread and contamination rate of other species, as I mentioned before, and temperatures of water and our coastlines are continuing to rise as global warming uh, takes more of a stronger effect and we can see more of that just through a picture like this. Moving on with the climate change, this is an article that I found that I was, um, thought was very efficient in getting this idea through. So what it is basically explaining is that due to waters warming and this disease spreading, starfish and other species uh, related to it are effectively suffocating due to this. There's not enough oxygen due to the rising heat that um, is not allowing for the starfish to spread that through their limbs and membranes and take in that oxygen. So this is allowing for the bacteria that is on them to grow at a um, exponentially faster rate due with warming waters and spread more effectively. This can also cause ocean dead zones, which is exactly as it sounds. There is there are spots where um, no species currently are due to um, the increase in temperature in the water and with that the lack of oxygen that is in um, each of these dead zones. So what's being done? So the most affected starfish um, from what I have found in my research is the sunflower starfish. These populations were the most um, decimated out of any other population. Uh, they were the first attacked and came to around 90% of loss in populations along the co of the coast of California. 
And in the past 10 years, researchers and scientists have been using breeding in controlled settings to try to bring these populations back up and reintroduce them into the wild, into these kelp ecosystems to allow them to rebalance what was lost in that ecosystem. And this is still um, being done today in stronger efforts, but as I said before, war global warming and temperature rising waters is allowing for this disease to spread. So those starfish that are reintroduced are still at a strong threat of um, being attacked and populations declining again. So what can you do? There are three different levels of impact that you can have. So there's a low impact, so that's something just simple um, as upgrading your light bulbs to more energy efficient bulbs that take uh, less power and cause less um, light um, pollution. Some moderate steps would be not using a dryer when washing your clothes or recycling, washing your clothes on cold and not warm and um, making sure that you are being as sustainable as possible to help combat the effects of climate change. Now with high impact, um, it's more extreme and people have less of um, an urgency to go in this path, but something as switching to an electric car or completely going green with energy or your diet, riding bicycles instead of um, fossil fueled automobiles. And these are just high extremes and the most extreme probably being having one or fewer than one child, so no children. And that's a high extreme just to lower um, future carbon footprint uh, problems. But I know that's a lot of information and these things are not easy to do. So there's one thing that if you don't take away anything from this, anything from these uh, climate change, um, efficiency, problem solving um, actions, one thing I would like you to do is to talk to others. Tell others about what you learned here today. Talk to your friends about how um, this disease is being spread and causing ecosystems to collapse due to human action and our emissions that we release every day that is rising, um, raising the temperature of our waters and our world. So if you do not want to take these impact, low impact, medium impact, high impact ideas um, and implicate them in your life, one thing you could do is to tell others because they might be um, encouraged to do so or find a sense of urgency in themselves through an emotional connection to this um, species of starfish or to any other species that um, are having declining populations due to the problems of climate change um, overall. So thank you, that is my TED talk. I hope everyone has a wonderful